So let's talk about portraits. Now, if you're looking for one of those fashion-y type portrait tip videos, the ones that show you how to pose people and do people's hair, this may not be the video for you. What I'm gonna do is talk you through nine tips that I think are important when taking portraits. Number one, trust your gut feelings over the rules. Technical know-how is not artistic know-how. Understanding ISO, aperture, shutter speeds, things like the rule of thirds, how to pose a model, how to make them look slimmer, younger, etc. They're all really important things to know from a commercial sense, but that won't help you take a great portrait. You need to tap into your intuitive understanding. And our intuition is a result of all our collective thoughts and experiences, and it knows a lot more than our conscious mind is capable of accessing at any one time. It's why sometimes we might get a bad feeling about someone, but we don't really work out what it is until later. It's because your subconscious mind is picking up on tiny nuances in body language and speech and behavior. It's about utilizing that intuitive understanding and combining it with technique. And that can lead to a great portrait and it doesn't have to follow the rules. Two, make the eyes your focus. And I don't mean simply focusing on the eyes. I mean, think about what the eyes are doing. Think carefully about where your subject is looking. Are they looking at the camera? Are they looking away from the camera? If they're looking away from the camera, we catch them in situ. We start to imagine what they might be thinking or feeling. It feels like a more honest approach. A subject looking straight into the camera is more confrontational. They're looking directly at the viewer and the viewer is looking back. You're creating a connection with them. It's important to understand what you're communicating from where your model is looking. Now with group portraits, this is an interesting one. If the whole group is looking straight at the camera, everyone kind of loses their individuality. It doesn't really make it a bad shot, but it's very different from if everyone is looking in a different direction. If everyone is looking in a different direction, you're capturing a scene. You are an onlooker, an invisible voyeur, looking at a scene. But if you have a scene where everyone is looking in a different direction, except for one person who is looking directly into the camera, then the viewer creates a connection with that person and they become their route into that scene. Three, think about the setting that your subject is in. What is the relationship between the foreground and the background? Choose what to include and what to exclude. Think about your aperture. A wider aperture will give you a shallow depth of field. It will make your photo completely about the subject. A smaller aperture will give you a wider field of focus and your subject will become part of an environment. You create a stage for your subject in which everything in the scene is an important part of the portrait. If you remove the background altogether, as in just have it just a plain color, white or black, then you remove all context from the photo. So this is better for people of importance, celebrities, people who are recognizable, rather than someone who's just randomly off the street and taken out of their context. So don't just buy a lens that opens to f1.2 and just always shoot at f1.2 just because you can, because sometimes the background is an important part of the whole image. Sometimes the scene can say just as much, if not more, about the subject. Take a look at this photo by Claudia Yank. It begs the question, does a portrait even need a person? You can tell so much about this person's lifestyle, their values, their routine, their economic status, their age. It's an important thing to consider when you're taking a portrait. Four, use lighting well. Think about what your lighting choices are saying about your portrait. Take a look at these. With natural light, you get an honest look. Different lighting can create different moods, like warm evening light can create a certain mood, cold winter morning can create another mood, the eerie cast of moonlight in the dead of night can create a completely different mood again. You can sometimes use the shapes and shadows that natural light casts to be a major subject in your photo. If you use on-camera flash, you get a very bright, brash, bold, punky style. Uh, this shot by Terry Richardson, for example, a bright flash onto your subject is a hit of light. It's like an attack. When using studio lighting, I tend to favor more simple lighting. The more lights and complexities you involve in your lighting setup, the less real your shot will feel. This is an example of a single softened light source with maybe a bit of minor fill from a reflector. It's what we call Rembrandt lighting. It's very simple to achieve, and I think it's rather effective. Most of the time, you should probably avoid using flash to fill in dark areas in ambient light. 
Sure, it will get you a nice, clean, sharp, bright shot, but you risk losing a bit of that ambience and feeling. Five, let your subject be natural. Most people like to smile when they're having their photo taken, but a smile is a mask, it's a facade. You have to get rid of that, wait for it to drop, find a truer representation of them. Pay close attention to your model, observe what they do when they're not posing, and use that as a guide to pose them. There are a number of techniques you can employ to get people to relax a bit more when you're taking their photo. Don't hide behind a camera, maybe set your settings, then lean around and chat to them, and fire away while you're, while you're talking to them. Another good technique is to get people to look at something else for a while. So maybe go, maybe ask them to look down at the floor and then look up at you. There's that initial moment when they haven't yet formed an expression and that gives a bit more of a truer representation of who they are. Sometimes you can set up your camera and just call someone and as they look around to see what you're calling them for, you can press the shutter. Maybe you could get them to read something off the floor. Just say, oh, could you just tell me what that number is on that bit of masking tape down there? and they'll read it and then they'll look back up at you or whatever. When taking candid street shots, you've just got to be confident. Sort of pretend you're not doing anything. Just put your camera up and if people look at you, just kind of just keep it there. And just kind of look beyond them. Don't look at them, don't acknowledge them. Just um, pretend they're not there. Imagine almost like you're photographing beyond them and they're in your way. Most people won't challenge you. Another great technique for taking photos of people on the street is to set up your shot and then wait for someone to walk into it. That way the balance of responsibility is shifted because it's your shot and they're walking through it. But try not to look too much like you're taking a shot because a lot of people will, will wait and sort of try to be helpful by standing just out of your shot. A slightly more confident approach is to set up a shot and wait for someone to just notice you. And that second they notice you, take their photo. There's something very nice about those shots. That kind of blank expression, the spontaneity of it is, uh, there's something really good. But when getting people to pose for you, it's not about making them feel relaxed. It's about getting them to drop that facade. So sometimes employing weird techniques can be helpful. Get them to just break out of their comfort zone. Take a look at this photo by Bettina von Zwell, Zwell, Zwell. I don't know how to say. Here, she sat a model in the complete pitch black and made them listen to music. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, she flashes the flash and releases the shutter. And you get this really, really candid moment of someone just involved in this emotional experience. There's all sorts of techniques you can employ to get people to drop that facade. All you've got to do is break social convention. So get them to jump up and down, get them to hold their breath for as long as they can, get them to try and work out a maths problem. Pretend you need help with working out something on your flash. And then while they're, while they're thinking about it, then you get your shot then. You can get some really, really interesting results this way. Six, learn to not care. There's a great quote by David Foster Wallace that says, you'll worry a lot less about what people think of you when you realize how seldom they do. There's something very liberating in that when you realize that everyone is basically just concerned about themselves and don't really care too much about other people, you can use that as a very liberating force to go and do what you want more confidently. Because confidence is something you do, it's not something you are, and like with everything, with practice, it gets better. There are various things you can do to help sort of boost that confidence just to go around doing things. Personally, I like to listen to music, just put my headphones in, walk around, take photos, and I feel less a part of the world. It feels like more like I'm watching something and it gives me much more confidence. Ultimately, you can just go up and talk to people, ask people to take their photos, because most people are really nice and they're really helpful. And at the end of the day, it is frightening. That's not gonna go away. But what you need to do is learn to embrace that fear, learn to enjoy it, be like one of those adrenaline junkies. Learn to live with the fear, feel the fear and do it anyway. Because you're always gonna look back and regret what you didn't do rather than what you did do. If you went for something and it failed, you're gonna feel a lot better about that than if you never went for something and what you could have got if you had gone for it. Just a basic rule of life there, really. Seven, think about what lens you're using because different lenses have different feelings use the right one for what you want to get. So for those wider shots that show the subject more in context of their environment, somewhere from around a 24 to around a 50, kind of a good place to be. Personally, I like a 35. 
that's my lens of choice. But everyone's different. I find 35 is kind of a good middle ground for that sort of thing. For closer in shots, tighter in shots, head shots, somewhere around a 70 to a 135. Personally, I like an 85. It's a nice focal length. If you go really long, if you go 200, 300, 400, you start to get that kind of paparazzi look and it feels very, very voyeuristic and very, very detached from your subject. A closer in lens like an 85 will compress the features a bit more. A 50, 85 will give a very kind of honest view of someone. 35 close in, 24 especially will give a more exaggerated look to the features which can be to your advantage depending on what you're looking to get. There are no solid rules, there's no such thing as a good portrait length. Eight, know the law. This is more one for just being out on the street. When you're out in a public place, you can pretty much take photos of any adult you want. Kids are different, they have different rules around them. And unless you have a particular restraining order or something, you can pretty much take photos of anyone. You don't need a model release unless you're using it for commercial purposes but you can be arrested for harassment if you are following someone around taking photos of them. So don't do that. You're not allowed to show people in a defamatory context. So best not to take photos of people walking out of a sex shop in Soho and exhibit that around because they might sue you. Be very careful with celebrities because they have really good lawyers and they like to sue people because their public image is their livelihood. You can photograph children, but you need the permission of the parent or guardian. Just a bit of common sense, really. I mean, if you go and you're taking pictures of uh, street children in Peru, then you're less likely to get sued because they're less likely to see it. It's a bit more of an observational sort of slice of life than if you just go out in London and take a photo of someone's child. Generally, top level rule, if you're taking photos of people in the street, just don't be a dick about it. If people ask you not to do it, don't go, well, I think you're fine, legally I can. Just walk away, find something else. Don't be a dick because the police don't always know the law and it's just, it's gonna be a whole heap of hassle sorting it out. Be aware that public spaces can be privately owned and you get some gray areas. So maybe a pub or a cafe is a public space. So you may be able to take photos in there, but if they're having a private event and you're taking photos of the private event, then it gets a bit more of a gray area. The police can seize your equipment and they can delete your photos if they believe it will prevent a crime. And only if they believe it will prevent a crime. If police do stop you and take your stuff, get a receipt from them for your stuff. They shouldn't be able to delete your photos unless you're planning something really bad. So don't do that either. It's all right to have brands and logos in your photo, but they need to be two things. They need to be incidental and they need to be an honest portrayal and also they can't be used for advertising. So incidental as in not the subject of the photo, honest portrayal as in how they are meant to be used. So someone wearing an Apple watch is fine because you know people wear that, you don't have to blur it out. But someone wearing an Apple watch with a bracelet that you're trying to sell, you can't do that. Finally, number nine, Take your time. Don't cut your session too early. As the shoot goes on, there will be tiny, tiny nuanced changes in facial expressions and mood, and that can completely change your photograph. Push through, keep going until you get that shot that you really want, until you're sure you've got it. So I hope that's been helpful. Uh, those are nine tips from me for taking better portraits. I'll see you later. Thank mm -hmm. you.